Hi there, my name is Ken Mayer and I'm going to be your instructor for this course on the Windows Server Enterprise Administration. Now I've been working in this field since the very early 80s and over that time I've seen a lot of different operating systems, a lot of different networking technology and uh, when it comes to the world of Windows I started uh, really when NT4 came out which was uh, 1996 or so somewhere around in that area. From that point on, I continued to work with that entire suite of the Windows network operating systems as we moved into Windows 2000 through 2003 server and, of course, into 2008 server. Now, over that time, I've also worked a lot in the network infrastructure realm and the routing and switching realm as well, and uh, which is going to be useful as we talk about some of the transitions that we'll see into uh, different uh, IP address uh, options from 4 and 6 and some of the uh, different encryption. I've also worked a lot in the world of security, and so you'll hear me talk a bit about some of the uh, security aspects of what we should be looking at, especially in protecting our communications and our data, which are also going to be part of what we talk about. So let's go ahead and get started with the Windows Server Enterprise Administration. Now in this chapter, we're going to talk about planning for Active Directory, which means we're not actually installing it, we're not configuring it, we're at that part before any of that happens, which is looking at our organizational needs and understanding the best way for us to be able to uh, work with our domains and the forest structure that we want to put out there. We're also going to look at the physical layout of our network so we understand what that topology looks like so we can better determine of course things like where to put domain controllers, how to create different sites, and if we have multiple sites to deal with the replication issues that go on between them. So that's our goal here in this uh, chapter is to talk about these plans that we have for working with Active Directory prior to doing the implementation. We're going to start off by talking about the logical design aspects when it comes to the actual Active Directory. In fact, there's a logical and a physical. And uh, in the logical design, that's where we're going to be having a discussion about the forests, domains, the types of trusts that we have between domains, between forests, uh, the functional levels that we have uh, options of with uh, using Windows 2008 server, and also about the Active Directory schema. So we'll start off with the forest, and in fact the forest would be the uh, beginning or the foundation of the logical structure of Active Directory because you can think of it as kind of that logical container that's going to contain all of the domains uh, if we have more than one that we're going to use and uh, kind of uh, proceeds from that point on. So the forest design is the first thing that we have to look at. Now when we talk about a forest, of course, it can be made up of multiple trees and uh, each of those trees can be made up of multiple domains. And if uh, that doesn't make uh, too much sense when you think, well, why do I want all those things? Well, I'm going to try to explain some of that as we go through uh, with this entire discussion. But remember that as a part of what we're doing here is we're looking at the design. What is it we're trying to accomplish by this creation? You know, as far as uh, do I need more than one forest? And a lot of you might have said, well, you know, a forest to me meant uh, that everything in my company was in my forest, and if there was another forest, that was a different company. Well, you're going to see that really in your design, you may have multiple forests that you're going to uh, present as your overall company or organizational structure, and that's to uh, help make sure you meet certain design needs, and that's kind of what we're looking at, the planning structure here. Now, when we talk about this entire process of uh, Active Directory, it has uh, been kind of renamed to Active Directory Directory Services. In fact, uh, a lot of things uh, in the realm of identity services uh, have been put into this category of Active Directory with 2008 Server. So uh, you're going to see things like AD Certificate Services, AD uh, Federation Services, AD Rights Management, AD LDS, uh, the Lightweight Directory Service. All of these things now are under this uh, identity type of, um, of uh, setup with Microsoft. And so when I do refer to Active Directory, almost always I'm going to be talking about the Directory Services or Domain Services, the ADDS. Now, uh, that's what we're going to be considered as our network operating system. Now, if this is the only requirement that you have, you know, if this was part of the planning and somebody said, well, all I need is just to have uh, this, these directory services so that I can have that centralized uh, management of users and computer accounts and uh, be able to have that single sign-on. If that's all you needed, then probably the answer is, hey, this is an easy setup. You need one forest, uh, which, by the way, you have to have at least one forest, and you might even be able to get away with having a single domain in that forest. Meaning that um, in the breakdown, by the way, uh, within a forest you have one, at least one tree. Each domain controller, the first domain controller you make, is going to be the root of that first tree. And uh, of course if you had any child domains, it would be a part of that same tree. 
and so you could have multiple trees. Anyway, in this situation, if I have just one domain controller, it is the root of the only tree, and since it's the only thing in the forest, it's also the root of the forest, and often that very first domain controller, you'll hear us talk about it as that forest root. And having said all of that, to simply say this, if your only requirement is uh, to have Active Directory, then that single forest will suffice, and probably even just that single root um, of that forest. Now, when we look at uh, using Active Directory as an enterprise solution, you might have some requirements that uh, mean that you have to have separate directories, whether it's for security or for regulatory laws. Uh, in that case, you might have multiple forests being involved. Now, with multiple forests, you have a true separation of entities where there's not a, you know, a single administrator that can be in charge of all of the forests, at least not without you really going out of the way to try to make that happen. And so uh, that might be a part of another part of your enterprise solution. You might also see that you have uh, some, maybe some application that needs to have a directory service, but you don't want it to necessarily use the same directory services that is housing all of the user accounts. And so a part of your solution might be to use that lightweight directory service called the uh, ADLDS. And what that does is it allows you to have an internet directory, um, in a way, kind of like a customer uh, database, uh, that is utilizing the same type of hierarchical database as Active Directory directory services, uh, but it's uh, really just kind of a shell of that uh, same database. In other words, it's not pre-populated with all of your objects that you create in Active Directory. It's an empty database that's just waiting for you to uh, create its own hierarchy and can be utilized. Um, it could be utilized by directory services, could be utilized by applications, uh, lots of different uses for it. So again, those are options we have for Active Directory directory services, and those are things that we have to start to consider about, you know, how do we want to utilize this within our organization? Now, having said all of that, there's another part of the planning that we'll look at, but right now we're kind of looking focused at the objects themselves. And when I get into the discussion of trees, that's going to be where we start talking about some of the uh, DNS options that we have as far as the naming convention. So I want to make sure you understand that I'm focusing, uh, you know, when I look at the domains and these forests, I'm really focusing on the directory services, the objects inside of Active Directory and not worrying about naming conventions. That's a kind of a separate argument that we would look at in our planning. So I just want to make sure that we're clear here as to the real discussion why you haven't heard me talk about trees so much. Now, you know, some people say, again, I don't get this multiple force. Well, let me give you kind of a, a quick rundown, one little example of a project I worked on many years ago, um, but it was still utilizing Active Directory as it was uh, uh, back in uh, the year 2000. In that uh, setup, and I was a part of a team, it wasn't just me taking it this big, large entity. I mean, we were all part of a team. But uh, we had uh, two organizations. I'm not going to name where this is. Uh, but what I'll tell you, it was uh, one of these uh, towns slash counties where there wasn't really a city per se. It was like all incorporated. I think uh, that's what they uh, look at it, like a big metropolitan area. And uh, But they still had a quote-unquote city police department and a county sheriff's office. And for whatever reason, those two entities up at the very topper man management, I guess basically the chief and the sheriff, uh, weren't necessarily um, happy with the other person. They, they didn't like each other that, that much. Uh, a lot of it because, was because of you know, pay disputes and other things. But anyway, that's outside the story. The part of the story is, is that when we were trying to work with bringing them into this Active Directory design, one of the uh, aspects uh, was basically saying that, uh, you know, if I was talking to the chief or the sheriff, it didn't matter, it was the same story. They didn't want anybody in that department to have any type of administrative capability in their department. Well, okay, if I had a single force solution, um, that might have been tough to do because there's going to be, you know, an enterprise administrator who can work with anything in that forest. And, uh, and so, you know, how do you separate that? I mean, there are many solutions, but what I'm suggesting here, and, and this was not the solution ultimately, but I'm just talking about why you might have multiple forests, that what they wanted was a separation of the forests so that the uh, entities in one department uh, were separate from the entities in a different department, but they could still have data communications through the way in which we can create these forest level trust connections. Um, and so that's why, you know, this is what we're trying to say is we're saying we need to plan and understand what are the requirements so that we can best utilize the uh, logical structure of Active Directory to come up with that solution based on those needs. 
Now, as we talk about the requirements before you start the design, and that's a lot of what I've just been saying, is that we should understand what are the requirements for our organization in using Active Directory. Now, we could bring it up into an organizational structure. And in the organizational structure, uh, that's where we're going to start worrying about, uh, of course, things like um, uh, how we want to manage it, uh, what kind of management options do we have? I might even look at uh, saying, you know, um, do I want to create people who are delegated to uh, have uh, control of a certain location or a certain area? Maybe I start looking at organizational units. How do I nest organizational units together to uh, look at that overall administration? Uh, do I need to have some sort of separation of objects through different domains? Uh, it, depending again on, on the way in which we want to set that up. Uh, and again, the idea, if, if you think about it, is with separate domains, we have separate collections of objects that are independently managed, have their own domain administrators, and that might be a part of the uh, management that I have. Uh, I very well might have a domain for uh, the uh, European part of my country and a domain for the North American part of my country. And uh, organizationally inside that domain, I might choose uh, to, uh, you know, maybe take on that North American domain and have an organizational unit for Canada, one for the United States. You know, however you want to break that out, it, it's kind of uh, what you have to plan. A lot of that around administrative requirements. You also have the operational requirements. Uh, the operational requirements are going to uh, be talking about, uh, you know, looking at all of the locations that I have to service uh, and, and what kind of communications. In other words, in this operation, am I going to require uh, secure communications? Uh, if I'm talking from one branch office to another, should they be communicating with IP security? Uh, do I have web applications that I need to have available? Uh, do those web applications have to be available to people in a different forest where I might have to look at uh, federation services to be able to uh, make that happen? Uh, legal requirements. Uh, legally, if I uh, were to talk about some of the reasons for multiple forests, uh, working with uh, uh, a company, again, I won't say which one it is, uh, but they, uh, they, they worked in the stock trading uh, arena. Uh, that's what they did. They had customers and they represented those customers. They worked with their uh, accounts and bought stock, sold stock, you know, kept that portfolio for them. But at the same time that they were doing that, they had another group of people that would work with a large company and uh, try to manage their um, working in the stock exchange as well. Well, so now we got a problem because we have a, in the same company, we have people who are working with other corporations and have insider knowledge about that corporation, which could influence the other group whose job was to invest the money. And of course, it would be illegal for them to use that inside information on their customers or even for themselves in trying to make a profit of something, you know, maybe they know something's coming up and so they're hedging their bets. And so we have to uh, create what's often called this Chinese wall, which is you know, to make sure that the group of the company that was working with corporations had no ability to be working with the other part that was doing investments. And so again, that might be a legal requirement. It is a legal requirement, by the way. And so we need that separation. That might be, again, a requirement of multiple force. So we have that separation. And of course, we also have to look at what kind of connectivity do we have, especially amongst a uh, dispersed uh, company where I have branch offices maybe all over the world, all over the state. What kind of connectivity do we have? Do we have high-speed links? Are we working great with Ethernet services? Are we still back in the old days of our fractional T1? Uh, hopefully not doing dial-up, but you know we have to look at those types of bandwidth ca uh, capabilities as well in our design because we're going to want to uh, think about uh, placements of servers. And of course, that starts kind of moving us into the physical aspect there as well. Uh, but again, that's uh, all a part of um, kind of the requirements of what we look at to understand functionally what we want to have happen and uh, how those questions are going to be answered in our design. Now, as a part of the requirements, as I said, uh, one of the things we looked at was autonomy versus isolation. Now, autonomy simply means the ability to be able to work on my own. And we have services and data as far as the different types of autonomy. Now, services would be uh, dealing with things like uh, adding new directory services, new domain controllers, uh, you know, working with the, that logical structure of, um, of the, the actual Active Directory, our domains and uh, domain controllers, as I just said, and different trees and that sort of stuff. And, and whether or not I want to have people that can work independently and, uh, and work with those services. 
as opposed to the data part of that, which is the objects we're managing, the stuff that's being stored in the directory services. That's your computer and user accounts, uh, maybe shared paths, distributed file systems, uh, printers that are being published in Active Directory. Those are the objects inside of Active Directory. And again, I might want to have groups of people that can manage those objects inside, but I don't want them creating new um, domain controllers or uh, creating new sites. And so that's where we have these services and data. And the autonomy is uh, you know, the ability to uh, be able to let a person function uh, with that data and maybe with just even a subgroup of that data so that I'm not saying all user accounts, but maybe the ones in uh, your state or your city at your branch office. Uh, but, but you still have that ability to work with those objects. You're not dependent upon another administrator to give you what you need done in your location. Now, isolation, when we talk about isolation of services and data, that, that is that separation. Uh, the isolation of services uh, could be in uh, looking at where we have site placements. Um, and uh, thinking about you know how do I separate those and, and how do I make them communicate, especially uh, when uh, there might be not the best communications process in the world. Isolation of data or the isolation of objects, which uh, maybe it's different domains uh, that will work, where I can have a group managing a, uh, a domain of their user accounts and groups separate from another domain. But then again, you know, you don't have true isolation in that such situation. In fact, one of the things I have to tell you, you're not going to have true isolation within the same forest when it comes to data. Because no matter how many domains or trees you create within that forest, uh, there's still going to be that one administrator or group of administrators that can do anything they want. And so true isolation in Active Directory does result in having multiple forests so that I don't have uh, you know, that one user that can do everything through all of the objects. Uh, anyway, so when you're making the discussion and you're doing the planning of Active Directory, and I hope I've made some sense here, we want to talk about how much do I need to isolate the services and the data which is a part of my design. And inside of those isolated areas, perhaps, if you want to think of it that way, uh, how much autonomy do I want to give different management groups to be able to deal with services or with the objects in the data that we're uh, working with? Uh, and that's another, again, of all part of our planning and setup that we're going to get into better and bigger discussions with as we move through this course. But right now, it's just kind of that uh, checklist we're going through to make sure we understand how we're going to do the design. So I guess we can ask the question, how many forests are needed? Now, of course, that's going to be based on the requirements that you've come up with. And those requirements would talk about uh, the type of isolation you need, the type of autonomy, and it would be able to help you determine how many forests you actually need. Now, remember to have true isolation, especially data isolation, we were, were going to say you need more than one forest. Uh, but again, you might want to uh, maybe think that isolation is sufficiently done within the uh, different domains that you have, uh, with each domain having its uh, in charge of its own objects and merely only has to do replication through a global catalog, all of which, if you're not sure what I mean, we're going to talk about in more detail later on. Uh, but this is part of the planning stages, you know, understanding what I want to build. And, uh, and it's all going to come from, again, those requirements that you have for the organization, the type of isolation that you need, service and data isolation, and the type of autonomy, the service and data autonomy. Now, the organizational force model is actually pretty straightforward. You know, if I were to look at uh, this uh, design, where I might be able to get away with one domain controller within my entire forest. So, or, or I should say one domain within my entire forest. So if we think of the entire forest, and usually the domains are just uh, you know, a single domain uh, or, or the triangle that you see. Uh, the organizational force model, again, based on management and within management, might determine the type of uh, OUs that I need uh, to have uh, for the purpose of uh, my management and uh, maybe any child OUs that we have based on, again, uh, the type of management that I want to put into uh, place as far as what objects do I manage and how do I manage them. Uh, but in that case, all of my objects are contained within this one domain, and uh, often we think to ourselves, or within this one forest and in this one domain, that we think of uh, saying, okay, well, that works for us. That's based on my management model. Now, in my management model, you might choose to make other domains, and, uh, and, and you know, so we're actually going to talk more about the uh, uh, actual multi-domain options a little bit later on. So we're going to focus just on the forest model. And so in my example here, I made it easy by having one domain in my forest and having uh, the breakdown of management based on the containers that can uh, be found 
uh, inside of the domains inside of that forest. Now the next one is the resource forest model. Now in the resource forest model I'm basically going to draw two domains and tell you that they're each in their own forest. So that's why I have them side by side and not in this kind of a child um, parent relationship. And the goal is, is that you would put all of the resources within one of the forests and all of the uh, user accounts and other objects in another forest. Uh, and of course that would mean inside of a domain in that forest. Now there may be of course some user accounts in the resource domain but that's because you need to have those accounts that are going to be managing these resources. And over here all of the computer accounts that you create, all of the users and the groups and the rest of them would be over here. And uh, what we've done is now we have actually a, a true separation or isolation of the uh, of the resources from the accounts. And that doesn't mean though, you know, that this poor user trying to get over here to get to a resource can't do it. What needs to happen is that you would have to create a cross forest trust, or we'll call this here a forest trust, so that the resources uh, would trust those accounts in the uh, other forest to uh, be able to, again, see them, make them visible, and to be able to assign permissions or privileges. But uh, truly that would be you know, for the use of a resource, but not the management. The management would be up to the folks that were uh, in that particular forest for the resources. Now in the restricted access forest model, uh, what we're seeing here is that we actually have these two forests, which I'm going to represent by you know, just these domains, and that in each forest we have our user accounts, we have our computer accounts, uh, maybe our printers and everything else, all in uh, each of these different forests, so that they are truly um, isolated from each other. Uh, you could also say autonomous from each other, uh, that uh, they don't have any administrative control over the other ones. So it can be uh, you know data or user restrictions uh, that we separate. But uh, in the restricted access forest model, what we're kind of doing is creating our own self-contained trees or forests, I should say, um, on both sides. And if we want to allow communications, we can still allow communications through a series of trust relationships uh, or even just for um, use of web applications, maybe even federation services to allow that kind of communication. Um, again, that's uh, depending on your requirements the level of isolation and the level of autonomy. Certainly in this case, uh, all of these objects here uh, in the one forest are isolated from the objects in the other forest. And how I then break down the autonomy of the uh, management would just depend on what I do within each of the forests that you see represented. But those are some of the models that you would see as a solution for most of your uh, organizational needs, for most of your um, uh, needs of uh, isolation and autonomy both for data and for services. Now within the forest we uh, break it down into containers uh, called domains. In fact we used to think of uh, the domain as a security boundary and we, and we still can in the aspect that uh, within my domain I control all of those objects that are in that domain by my domain administrators and uh, objects in a different domain don't, unless I give them permission, aren't going to be having any type of administrative control. Also, we used to talk about uh, domains being the uh, uh, breakdown of uh, applying group policies, which is true. Uh, I can't make a single group policy uh, for one domain uh, automatically work for other domains unless I purposely link it to that domain. So in that aspect, it's a security boundary from our policies. I can't make a policy that I can apply to the whole forest, I guess is a better way of saying it. So in many ways it's a uh, container uh, or a partition of the total Active Directory as well as a security boundary. Now the, the goal here is to determine how many domains do you need and in which for forest should those domains be created. Now of course there is a minimum. To have even a forest, to even think of it, you have to have one domain. Um, and that domain, of course, would be the root of a tree, but we'll talk about trees later when we get to naming conventions. Uh, but you need at least that one domain to be able to have a forest. And of course, the first one you create in a forest is called the forest root. From there, it's uh, up to you to determine how many more you need. Now, uh, let's talk about why might I need more domains. Uh, it's not because of the old days. If I go back to the days of Windows NT 4.0, the use of the, of the term domain was really different than it was uh, today in the Active Directory. 
Uh, in, in those days, we chose to make different domains, uh, you know, some on security based on these trust relationships and how we could have users from one domain access things in a different, different domain. But, you know, they were truly isolated. Each of those domains literally could have been interpreted by today's term as their own force because, you know, in one domain it was all self-contained and there was nothing in a different domain that you could do to work with the first one. It, they just were these different objects and the reasons we made them often were because of limitations to how many objects could be stored in that domain. Uh, literally, you could have a large corporation with multiple, multiple domains only because they had so many objects to keep track of. Uh, you know, you go to this large, you know, nationwide, worldwide store with 100,000 employees, it was like, yeah, we can't put them in one domain. It just it would break. Now, that's not true in Active Directory. It's not about the number of objects that you create that determine how many domains to be made. Now, yes, I did say a domain is a partition of Active Directory. In other words, if you have a million objects you're keeping track of, I'm just using big numbers to make this easy math, and, uh, and I want to have a partition of about 200,000 objects in one domain, that's great. Uh, you can have that partition, put 200,000 objects in there, and then you're saying, well, now it's going to be easier because now I can have another domain in that forest with another of those 200,000, and so now things are working. Well, guess what? At some point, they are fully aware of all of the objects through Global Catalog. Um, which the global catalog, by the way, has got that entity inside of the forest that knows about everything in the forest. So, you know, the separation isn't now because of the size, because we still have to have that one object that's containing all information. The goal now is for you to determine how to partition things, maybe because of WAN connectivity. You know, if I have a company that really does have, um, uh, you know, a presence in, say, in North America, a presence in Europe, a presence uh, in Asia, but I don't have high speed connectivity, I certainly don't want to have to worry about replication traffic going across those so slow links. So I might partition my uh, network now into different domains for each continent because of WAN connectivity. Uh, and so that makes sense because now we can control replication. But now remember, even inside of your domain, you may have different locations that have uh, different offices in the domain that have connectivity issues. We'll deal with that when we get to the physical aspects and talking about sites. But I'm just talking about uh, some of the things that you might have to uh, use as a goal to determine how many domains you need and why you need them. Uh, and potentially which forest especially if you're using a multiple four solution should each of those domains be created in. All right, so as I said, the requirements of a domain, they're often thought of as a partition to the forest to make them smaller, perhaps more manageable units. Now remember, again, consider the replication capability because that might be a reason to have more than one domain. Now, uh, every domain controller within a domain must replicate with the other. That we know for sure, but the domain controller in my domain will not replicate with a domain controller in another person's domain, at least not on the domain controller side of it. Global catalog is a different story. Um, and, but still, so that's where it's a boundary to be able to say, okay, hey, I got it. I've got a boundary here of uh, replication. And of course, like I said, uh, a boundary of policies. I could apply a password policy to my domain, and maybe your domain has a different requirements for password policies, so I make a different password policy over there, and so those two policies will not conflict with each other. Even if one domain's a, a parent over the other one, it still doesn't inherit down, so it's also that security boundary as well. Um, all right, so uh, those are some of the things we have to look at. Now, again, why do the, the partitioning? Uh, it might be, again, to make the smaller units, as I already talked about, replication and security boundaries. But it could also be an issue of uh, management. Again, of, you know, knowing that a domain's um, a collection of objects, a partition of the larger piece of the forest, and maybe that makes sense also in my administrative uh, decisions of how to manage objects and how to assign people or groups of people to be in charge of that uh, part of the, uh, of the overall active directory. Now, there are a couple of examples that you might use for the domains. Uh, again, a single domain model uh, is very easy. It's a forest with one domain, and all of the directory data is in that one partition. So uh, that's it. That's all under one, uh, one big roof there. Now, what that means, of course, when we talk about autonomy, you have to remember that we have um, you know, uh, domain administrators that can uh, potentially do anything they want in the domain. We have an enterprise administrator, which uh, in this case would be pretty much the same creature as the, uh, as the uh, domain administrator because that's just one domain for all of my Active Directory. 
Uh, don't worry, the enterprise admin does have some other things they can do, uh, you know, like working in the schema and things like that. But, uh, but again, they're pretty much, uh, you know, when it comes to actual directory data, they're, they're both the same as far as what they uh, have available to them. Um, but that's that single domain model. There's not really a lot of isolation in this model because the objects are within one container. Another example of the domain model is the regional domain mo model. Now, regional, again, uh, could be you're dealing with uh, the, WAN, the WAN connectivity, you know, the wide area speeds. So um, we could, again, have uh, a regional domain model built on the geographical placement of domains uh, of, uh, of the different parts of our company. Knowing that regional locations um, can talk to each other with maybe better high-speed connectivity than they can their counterparts over uh, across the ocean or across even the country. Uh, you might decide to have different domains, not just for the entire continent, but maybe east coast, west coast, and that type of uh, situation. It all kind of depends on what your needs are. Uh, and as I said, it could be based on physical connectivity. It's certainly an option that you can look at. Uh, but it's also going to be dependent on uh, how you want to partition and manage those objects as well. So the question then is, how many domains do we need? And really, the uh, choice of domains, as I've said, can be based on physical connectivity, which of course will affect the replication scheme. But the decisions can also be based on the numbers of managed objects. Again, there's not an actual limit of objects, but really maybe about how much replication traffic or security issues might be involved. So think of it this way. If I have a slow connectivity between two sites, two locations in my company, I hate to use the word site because you're thinking Active Directory. I might be you know, saying that you know, I have a site in uh, Boston, I have a site in uh, Los Angeles. You know, we're talking about geographical locations when I say that word site. Uh, but let's say I do, let's say I have a uh, that East Coast, West Coast, and, uh, you know, and uh, there's a slow connectivity there between um, uh, the two. Uh, maybe it's a T1. All right, so it's a T1. If your goal, and, and this is just a mathematical process, you know, to think about the uh, number of objects that I would replicate and how much of that T1 bandwidth might I take. Uh, I, I think the mathematics I saw as an example was saying, look, if your goal was to use 5% of that T1 for replication traffic, then that means that you would have to have a limit, theoretical limit, of 100,000 objects to have replicated because that 100,000 objects would be about 5% of that bandwidth of a T1. Now, a T1 is not very fast to begin with, and 5% of that amount could really add up to be a lot. So that might be another uh, issue that is a part of the decision process. Again, it kind of sounds like that WAN connectivity is just my decision process, but I want you to know it doesn't have to be because uh, I could have one domain for my entire country and I could have uh, Boston be in a, in a dom active directory site and I could have Los Angeles be in an active directory site. I can still control the, uh, the uh, uh, replication between them but when they do replicate, they're going to have a lot of things. Let's say I have half a million objects. That's a lot of traffic that will have to be replicated. So if I just decide, you know what? Let's just not do replication uh, between those things, uh, other than the uh, you know, minutia that uh, we have in comparison to real replication with global catalogs. And that might be a choice of two different domains as to opposed to two Active Directory sites. Again, it's because of the number of people or objects I'm managing more than, you know, having the multiple sites. I hope I'm making sense as I explain these things to you. It's just, a, you know, why might I make that decision? And what I'm doing is I'm kind of battling both sides of the argument for you at the same time, hoping that you understand what we're looking at, that you have some flexibility, you have some choices. Um, but uh, when it comes to the question, how many domains, usually it's, um, again, based on the number of managed objects, because of the amount of replication that would be involved, and because of the physical connectivity, which of course also is an issue with replication. Now, when we ask the question about, you know, assuming that you're already working with Active Directory, and, uh, and we're going to be moving to the uh, 2008 um, domain controllers or the 2008 network from my server 2003, uh, we have to ask some questions. Would it be easiest for us to, to do an upgrade of our, of our existing network or to be able to create new domains and maybe have to migrate things over? So you ask the question, first of all, this is only up to, uh, up to debate if there is an existing Windows network. 
in that case, we have to ask some questions. All right, if we're going to do an upgrade versus a, a create, if I'm doing the upgrade, will the domain functional level that I have presently work? And would the new potential options I have of a new domain functional level work for any legacy servers that are out there? Also, as I'm doing an upgrade of domain controllers within this domain, uh, those domain controllers are going to be down while they're going through the upgrade. Can you afford that downtime? Uh, and of course, also ask questions, are there new features that are needed? One of the reasons I'm doing this upgrade or doing, move, making the move to the new um, uh, features in 2008 server is because there's things there I want to use within my existing network. And so you also have to ask those questions too because that's going to determine, you know, what domain functional level do I want to be able to get those new features? Well, the first domain you create is the thing that starts this entire process. It's going to be the first one in the forest, and it'll have that special designation called the forest root domain. In fact, it's usually the only domain that is immune to changes, because if you were to change it, especially destroy it, you would destroy the entire forest. So it's like that one domain that you've got to have perfect, uh, because that's going to be that centerpiece of the rest of your forest. Now, uh, we often call it then the dedicated forest root domain. Not only that, but that one domain controller within that uh, very first um, uh, forest or tree in that forest, when that happens, um, it's also going to have all of the FISMOs that we talk about, all the uh, specific uh, types of um, uh, operations masters that go with the Active Directory. Things like the uh, RID master and the infrastructure master and all these other little roles we haven't got to the point to talk about just yet. Uh, are also going to be installed and running on this thing. So, I mean, it's a very important domain. Um, and I should say that very first domain controller, because that's where you make the domain, is on that first domain controller. Uh, it's going to be very important to you. So, uh, it's a dedicated forest route. And, uh, and of course, you know, you could, if you're creating multiple forests, you may also have what we might call a regional forest route domain, uh, where, you know, we have uh, that separation, that isolation, different forests, uh, each with their own root domain. Now, uh, within a forest, a forest is made up of trees, and so we'll have a little brief discussion about the trees. Um, again, you can have many trees within a single forest. The idea of a, of a tree is that it's a root of the tree, of course, but it's the root of the naming convention for the domain name. In other words, when you create a domain, it basically has a, a, a name. And so let's say you're going to call it xyz.com. So that's that root. Now, if that uh, first domain has a child domain, let's call it training, its full name is going to be training dot, and then the basic DNS suffix of its parent, which was xyz.com. So the full name would be, you know, showing you kind of the path that we take to get back to the root of that tree. And every subsequent domain that you create underneath that first tree root is going to have the same suffix, xyz.com. Now, if all of a sudden you decide, you know, I need another completely separate uh, DNS name, but I still want it in the same forest, that's when you would create the next tree, because the next tree can have whatever starting uh, domain name you wanted to have, maybe abc.com. And then everything underneath it would have, as it, part of that root of that tree, abc.com. So again, that's where you might choose to have multiple trees or domain trees within the forest is based on your DNS uh, or domain names that you want to use uh, for you know, this whole setup. Often we call those the fully qualified domain names. We want them to be unique as far as the uh, suffix of each domain, but they're still administratively together. So that's many trees in the forest. Now, as we're working with domains, we have different functional levels. And uh, it's important you know what these functional levels do for you and, of course, what domain controllers are supported within each of these functional levels. And it's actually pretty easy to memorize this first part. The first part is, okay, look, we have Windows 2000 native. Now, believe it or not, people are going to say, well, isn't that just the level? Well, there was a mixed mode, too, where we were being backward compatible in the days of Windows 2000 with our NT4 uh, networks that were out there. Uh, and so when we moved to Windows 2000, what we got was the, all the same benefits of Active Directory and some other features. Anyway, in the Windows 2000 native then, the domain controllers that are supported would have been, of course, all of the, the uh, Windows 2000 servers, but anything in the future, that means 2003 and 2008. 
Now, if you were to upgrade to the Windows Server 2003 domain functional level, you lose the backward compatibility with Windows 2000 Server. In other words, the only supported domain controllers would be 2003 and 2008. And so obviously, if we move to Windows Server 2008, then the only domain controller supported would be a Windows Server 2008. Now, you make these moves based on the features that you want to be able to bring into your domain. And remember that I am talking about a particular domain within the entire forest. I'm not talking about the forest level or the forest functional levels, but that one piece, that one partition within the forest. Now, your domain functional levels, as I said, have these different features. And so let's look at what you got when you went to the Windows 2000 native. Again, that's where you lost that backward compatibility with Windows NT. And that was obviously by the first feature you got, which are universal groups. Because in Windows NT domains, there was not any type of a creature that would uh, contain objects from all those different domains, as we would call a universal group. Uh, and we had universal groups uh, in native uh, mode, both uh, security and distribution groups. We also were allowed to do group nesting. That would be our ability to place global groups into a universal group, um, you know, and, and you know, how we could uh, kind of uh, nest that out throughout the entire organization, putting different groups inside of other ones as long as we didn't break the uh, rules as far as uh, group membership. Uh, we were able to convert groups. They could uh, be converted from a security group to a distribution group. And we could even change the scope. We could change, under certain conditions, we could change a group from, uh, let's say, universal to a global or from global to universal or domain local. And again, there, are, there were a couple of rules we had to deal with because of uh, the membership of who can be in each of those groups. And it also kept track of the SID history, the security identifier history, which was a great tool, especially when we were doing migrations from one um, domain to a different domain. And the reason that was really important to us is that if we kind of migrated objects from one domain to another one, uh, we still had to have our old security IDs to match up those old uh, access lists that were on all of these different resources so we could still have access to uh, those uh, old resources plus be able to get new ones. So, I mean, that was kind of cool as well. With the Windows 2003 domain functional level, we still had all that same stuff with the native mode, but we got a command line tool called netdom.exe that helped us prepare for the ability to rename a domain controller. We also got an update of the logon timestamp. We were able to use the or, or use a uh, the, this user password attribute uh, to actually change it to uh, change the effective password of the inet org person object. Uh, we were able to redirect users to computer containers. We were able to use constraint delegation and even support for selective authentication. And then, as you move to the 2008 domain functional level, you still got all of those other features. But then we got uh, the distributed file system replication for Sysfall, a better improvement to uh, the type of replication between domain controllers. We improved the security from Kerberos. I mean, if you think about Kerberos in those old days, it was using DES encryption. And I hate to tell you this, but DES encryption is like 25 minutes to crack on my uh, little laptop. And so it wasn't very secure communications back, I mean, in that day it was very good, uh, but in, by today's standards it's not. So we got uh, AES, uh, 128 and 256-bit support for Kerberos authentication. Uh, last interactive logon information, and the ability to uh, get rid of that one password policy for one domain by using fine-grained password policies. In fact, we'll talk about some of these things as uh, we continue on within this course. But those are uh, some of the things that you have to decide about, um, you know, to take that nice list of features and put it back into our discussion when you're making the plan for uh, the number of domains that you want, uh, you also have to make the plan for what features do you want to enable and, uh, and doing so at the domain functional level. If we move back to the discussion of the planning of our forest, we can have the same discussion about forest functional levels as I just did with the domain functional levels. Our goal is to know what kind of features do I need um, or do I want to add into my uh, existing network. So again, the forest functional level, now remember, forest is everything involved, it means that we have to uh, have basically a certain domain functional level to support. So when I was uh, working with a Windows 2000 native functional level for the forest, that meant that all of the domains had to at least be a domain functional level of Windows Server 2000. Uh, if it didn't meet that, then, you know, if there were those uh, NT boxes, we couldn't do it, uh, or we'd effectively cut them off. Uh, but, of course, backward compatibility means that my forest functional levels at Windows 2008, I still can work with 2003 and 2008 servers. 
Uh, if you move the force functional level up to Windows Server 2003, you're going to hear the same story we did with the uh, domain functional levels. Uh, we would support 2003, 2008. If you move to the Windows Server 2008 force functional level, it only supports Windows Server 2008. So what are the features then? What do we get for all of this? Well, with the Windows 2000 functional level, we're going to call that our default features. And then we're going to say, what did I get when I moved to 2003? Because that was the big one. Um, because really, when you move to 2008, you're really not getting additional features other than making sure you're all working with 2008 servers, I guess. But in Windows 2003, a big uh, jump there. We got the Force Trust, which we'll talk a little bit about. The ability to uh, rename our domains. Uh, to have linked value replication, the read-only domain controllers, a better working uh, knowledge consistency checker or KCC, to be able to create an instance of the dynamic auxiliary class, to convert the INET org person to a user object, the uh, application basic groups, the LDAP query groups, and to be able to deactivate and redefine attributes within our schema. Big changes there between the 2000 2003. Uh, and of course, like I said, with 2008, we didn't see any additional features. But remember, it was actually in server 2008 that we actually got uh, a server that could operate as a read-only domain controller. Now, the schema is something that exists forest-wide. And the schema is a dictionary of the objects I can create in the forest. I mean, if you want to create a domain, you want to create a user, you want to create a group, what are those objects? How do you define them? And what attributes can I configure on them? And that is defined by the schema. Now, when you are working with the schema, if you decide to make a change, like adding some new attributes to an object, remember it's something that you really can't reverse. It means you've got to be careful about your design changes. Now, of course, we can deactivate some of those uh, attributes, which is good, and we can redefine what they are. But, uh, you know, this is kind of a one-way trip, so be careful. Now, the only reason you have to really be careful is that if you make a change to a schema in a forest and you intend to merge it into a new forest or consolidate two forests together, some sort of migration, if the schemas aren't the same, it just doesn't work. Um, so that's the only time you really got to be careful about that. And the only way to get back to the old schema would be to destroy your whole forest and start over that might be a little bit of downtime. Uh, anyway, so be careful about what you do. Um, it, but it is, a, like I said, it's a dictionary of objects. Now, you know, we, we saw um, in many different technologies uh, the ability to, uh, to make some changes that can help support applications. As an example, if you wanted to um, utilize the um, uh, Configuration Manager 2007 uh, to be able to manage all these different uh, machines that are inside of your uh, network, that actual configuration is best used if it can uh, modify the schema. We call it extending the schema when we make those changes. And what it does is it puts information, attributes into schema that can be read by the objects that are you know, being managed by Active Directory to gather information about you know, where's my distribution point, uh, where's my reporting point, and all these uh, bits of information that make it work very well with something like Configuration Manager. So there's many applica applications that make changes to schema to make the applications work better. Even Exchange Server will make changes so that I can add something like a mailbox to my user account. All right, so one of the things you should do is if uh, a part of your plan and design is to have changes to schema because of these applications or other needs, is maybe first practice those changes in a lab environment you know, where if it goes bad, it's okay, I can recreate the lab and start over, uh, but kind of call it your practice or test run before you move it into production. Now, working with trust, we're going to get a chance to look more at trust as we move on through this course, but you might have to make some changes to the trust relationships to be able to improve your performance. Now, one of the things I have to tell you is that there are some trust relationships you can't do anything about. In fact, you don't want to be able to do anything about them. In other words, there is a trust between the tree roots within the same forest. Each parent uh, domain automatically trusts the child domains and vice versa the child domains trust the parent domains. And these trusts are transitive and they are two-way. Now what transitive means is that basically saying if uh, domain A trusts domain B and domain B trusts domain C then domains A and C will trust each other because they have that path, that transitive path of trust. In fact, that was a big deal in the days of Windows 2000 because that's not how it worked in the days of NT. 
Uh, now, being a two-way trust, in the old days, a one-way trust meant if I trusted you, then that means that, um, that uh, you know, my user accounts can, um, or your user accounts, I'm sorry, can access objects in my domain because I'm trusting you. I'm trusting that your user accounts are authenticated and so I can give them access into my domain. But that's a one way. It didn't mean that the opposite was true. That the, you know, if I, I wanted my user accounts to access resources in your domain, I couldn't use that one way trust coming at me. I had to have one going the other direction. So uh, we had to oftentimes make two one way trusts in the different directions to be able to handle that kind of uh, connectivity. Uh, whereas in the forest, all those pre built trust relationships between the tree uh, roots and between the child and parent. They're all automatically two-way trusts uh, where, uh, again, the relationship works in both directions. Now, there are some other types of trust that you can make because the trust path may take a while, and this comes to the speed. Um, and, uh, you know, when we talk about them in more detail, it'll make more sense. But we have some shortcut trusts, which is your ability to uh, be able to change the path of trust so you don't have to follow perhaps a long path up to the root and all the way back down. You can make a little shortcut. Or you can uh, also have different forests trust each other, especially if it's your organization, but you've done some isolation and have different forests, but need to have some connectivity between them for uh, uh, users in one forest to access objects in another, you would consider making a forest trust as well.